Okay, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I hope you can all hear and see me okay. Um, welcome to our next uh, online ordinary meeting this afternoon. Very pleased to see lots of you joining us this afternoon um, for our next online meeting. So as usual, first of all, just some housekeeping at, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, looking towards the top left of your screen, um, hopefully you can see a small green shield and that symbol means that you're using the most up-to-date version of Zoom and that it is secure. And I do also need to advise you that this meeting is being recorded. So we're going to have a lecture today and at the end of the lecture, questions can be asked as usual, um, but you will be muted. So please make sure that you use the Q&A facility found at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions um, and your questions will go to the panelists only. So a member of the RAS editorial team, Dr. Louise Alexander, will be helping to facilitate the Q&A session um, as usual. And also for the purpose of the Observatory magazine report, um, please write your name at the start of your question if you're happy to be included in that. OK, so that's the housekeeping and I just have some announcements to make. So first of all, I'd like to announce the winners of the online RAS GCSE Astronomy poster competition, which has been sponsored by Winton. Um, first of all, I'd like to announce the second prize and a £50 book token is awarded to Kieran Radway of the Royal Greenwich Observatory. And you can see the poster just being shown up on the screen now. And the poster title is Human Space colonization. And the first prize um, and a £100 book token is awarded to Lucas Farley of Marlborough College. Um, and the poster is just appearing on the screen now. And the poster title is Detecting the Geminids Using Radio Waves. So many congratulations to Kieran and Lucas, and I think they might be online listening to this this afternoon. Um, congratulations on your uh, fantastic posters. And uh, these posters will be also displayed on the RAS website um, for you to go and have a look at in a little bit more detail. Second announcement relates to the call for applications for the Caroline Herschel Prize Lectureship, which is now open. And the deadline for that is the 30th of April, and you can find more details about that on the William Herschel Society website. Um, a second point is about the specialist discussion meetings. Now, there are actually two sessions for astronomy specialist discussion meetings in the 2021-2022 season, which are still available. So the call for astronomy only, so not geophysics, but astronomy only proposals has been extended until the 9th of April, 2021. And we would urge you to consider submitting a proposal. So further information can be found on the RES website uh, or equally well, you can contact the Astronomy Secretary, Dr. Mandy Bailey, who'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, the next announcement is to do with the AGM. So the 201st, annual general meeting of the society will take place via Zoom at four o'clock on Friday the 14th of May 2021. And um, another notice relating to the National Astronomy Meeting, so NAM 2021, which is being organised in conjunction with Bath University, is going to be held virtually this year. And the RAS website will be updated with information um, as soon as we have more information available. OK, so on to our programme for this afternoon. Today's headline item is the Gerald Whitrow Lecture, uh, which is given every two years by an engaging and authoritative speaker on any topic in cosmology, including its philosophy. So the 2020 RES Gerald Whitrow Lecture will be given today by Professor Andrew Ponson from University College London. And Professor Ponson has conducted exceptionally creative and innovative work in a variety of fields from the dynamics of galaxy formation and evolution to the dynamics of general relativity and cosmological perturbations, as well as in the studies of the nature of dark matter and dark energy. 
So he is an excellent public speaker and is highly sought after for radio and television interviews and is part of the trajectory panel um, for the Cheltenham Science Festival, which develops ideas for events and future directions in public outreach. So I'm delighted now to hand over to Professor Andrew Ponson to give his Gerald Whitrow lecture uh, entitled Dwarf Galaxies in Cosmology. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that very generous introduction. I'm now going to uh, uh, switch on the screen sharing and uh, this is the first test that I actually get this right. Give me one second. Here we go. And hopefully that's uh, now showing up well on your screen. Um, I'm, uh, I'm too young to actually have uh, met Gerald Whitrow in person, but from everything I, I hear, he was great fun to, to listen to. Uh, so it's a great honor to be giving this lecture in his name, and I, I hope to uh, introduce you to some fun ideas. What I've chosen to talk about specifically is dwarf galaxies and their connection to cosmology, which is something that I've been working on on and off uh, throughout uh, the last 10 years or so. Um, but right now I'm working on it with uh, 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 a whole range of people, a whole range of collaborators and people that I'm working with. Uh, so I wanted to say that, uh, you know, the work that I'm going to show you today wouldn't at all be possible without all of the people that I've uh, put on the screen for you now, as well as uh, some others who uh, have, have moved on to other things. Uh, but I'll try and highlight the work of uh, some of these people as we go along. Uh, they work on something called the GM Galaxies team, and I'll also so get to what on earth uh, GM Galaxies is about a little bit later on. But uh, to get started, I wanted to talk a bit about the setting in which this takes place. So this is all about cosmology and the way that dwarf galaxies uh, might have something to say about cosmology. So it's worth starting by saying, what, what are the ingredients of our current paradigm for cosmology, which is sometimes known as the, the Lambda CDM paradigm for reasons that I'll be explaining in a moment. Uh, the ingredients start off pretty uncontroversially that uh, first of all, you start with general relativity, which is our best description of the way that uh, space-time uh, behaves in the presence of the material throughout the universe. And you add to that the standard model of particle physics, which is again, our best description of how the you know, fundamental components of nature behave. And this is the thing that can be probed with giant machines here on earth, like the Large Hadron Collider and so on, and was so uh, successfully um, uh, uh, verified in some sense by the discovery of the Higgs boson just a few years ago. But unfortunately, that's not enough to explain what we see out there in the universe. It seems that we also need some component of what we call dark matter. That's an additional type of particle that's not present in the standard model that hasn't yet been detected uh, here on Earth or created here on Earth. Um, and we don't really know how that relates to the rest of the standard model of particle physics except in so far as we know that dark matter had better be dark. That's what the, the, the name suggests, that it doesn't emit or in fact absorb light in any way. So we, we're only aware of its behavior through its gravitational effects on the rest of the universe. That might seem a little bit uh, speculative, but as I'm about to show you, it's, it's an idea that has generated a whole host of testable and verified predictions. Unfortunately, the speculation doesn't quite end there. Uh, we also now have dark energy, which is an additional component of the universe. It seems to be uh, accelerating the expansion of the universe, pushing the universe apart ever faster. And on top of that, you need some kind of theory to explain what happened in the early universe. How did the universe emerge from something as messy as the Big Bang and yet, yet end up as structured uh, as the universe we see around us today, which is beautifully structured, it seems sort of on large scales to be very homogeneous and isotropic, and yet it has um, uh, structures like galaxies and dwarf galaxies and clusters of galaxies and voids and so on uh, that are, uh, are very, very structured. And the theory that we have that is uh, our best candidate for explaining all that is something called inflation, which again is another speculative uh, extension 
to the standard model of particle physics. So the, um, the, the ingredients of our cosmological model are quite speculative, but on the other hand, it's a, a highly, highly successful paradigm. I mean, I think perhaps the most spectacular thing about this theory is that it predicted basically uh, exactly the pattern of fluctuations you would expect to see in the cosmic microwave background. So what you see here is something called a power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. Um, so go, go, going along the x-axis, you have different scales, and on the y-axis is the amplitude of waves on those scales. And the spectacular thing about this is that the red line is a theoretical line, whereas the points with error bars are what were actually observed by uh, ESA's Planck satellite. And there's just an absolutely exquisite match between these, um, up to a few parameters. There's a few parameters that you can tune in order to get the best possible fit, but basically everything hangs together pretty well. It does much more than that. Um, this theory of cosmology tells us about the way the universe expands over time. So uh, here is one um, uh, measure of that. This is based on something called uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, largely, where you use galaxy surveys to kind of measure the scale of typical ripples in the universe as a function of time. And that helps you measure the way that the universe has expanded over time. And again, overall, you get a really good fit between the, uh, the, the, the theory with parameters set by what you've seen in the cosmic microwave background and the actual experimental or observational results. And then on top of that, you can also go and probe the distribution of material in the universe, uh, and, and in particular probe the distribution of dark matter in the universe. Despite this being a very speculative idea, it has very well-defined effects because uh, by assumption, it's something that's interacting with everything else through gravity. And so you can use an effect called gravitational lensing, which is the distortion of light rays by the presence of curvature in space-time, which in turn is generated by the material in space-time. And you can figure out from that, where is the stuff in the universe? And it turns out that the stuff uh, is very much where you would, would expect it to be based on uh, this theory of cosmology. And in particular, uh, you, you certainly require dark matter to make sense of these observations and also the observations of the cosmic microwave background. So um, everything seems to match up pretty well. And if that were the end of the story, then uh, there wouldn't be much to, to say in some sense. But yet, if you, if you go on the uh, NASA's ADS and search for papers uh, mentioning crisis in connection with Lambda CDM, you'll find there's no shortage of people worrying. In fact, it seems like the crisis is only getting worse over time. If you have a look, the, the number of papers being written that uh, mention these two words together is growing pretty rapidly. So what's going on? There's actually a number of problems that have uh, come to light, some of them some time ago and some, some of them more recently. And the ones that I really want to focus on today are the ones in connection with dwarf galaxies. In fact, uh, here's a news story from 10 years ago now, uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, worrying about the fact that uh, dwarf galaxies uh, are, are showing that somehow the theory of cosmology, including dark matter, is, is wrong. And this uh, report came from no less than uh, Professor Carlos Frank, who uh, was saying at the time in 2011 he was losing sleep over this mismatch between uh, the, the dwarf galaxies as observed in the universe and, and what was predicted by simulations. Um, I, I think he has had some sleep since then, but uh, there, there are still problems when you look at the dwarf galaxy end. And they, uh, in, in my opinion, they haven't really gone away. They kind of fluctuate in significance over time as we change our understanding of these things. But uh, there's still some question marks hanging over whether we really understand these very small galaxies and, uh, and their implications for cosmology. So to get towards what the problems actually are, you can pretty much split them into four categories. And there's some overlap between these categories. It's not like these things are, are fully independent of each other. Um, but uh, the, the rough four categories that are worth being aware of are 
first of all, the masses of satellite galaxies around the, the Milky Way. So if you go and try and estimate the total dynamical mass of galaxies around our Milky Way, so that should include the dark matter contribution that's pulling the, the stars around through gravitational effects, then they seem to be somewhat lighter than what you uh, might have anticipated based on computer simulations. And those computer simulations are based, of course, on the idea of cold dark matter, the, uh, the, the, the putative uh, type of extra material in the universe. So there's that problem. There's also a problem just with the number of these satellites. So if you just take account of how many satellites you would expect given that uh, dark matter is uh, clumping into little structures around our Milky Way, then you might naively expect there to be far more small dwarf galaxies orbiting around our Milky Way than you actually see. A third problem is that if you actually go and measure the central densities of these objects, and they're, they're very good for doing that, actually, because they, they contain relatively few stars and not too much gas. You can use the motions of the stars and gas to work out pretty well how much uh, dark matter is there in the centre of these galaxies. And uh, as I'll show you in more detail in a moment, there seems to be a bit of a, a mismatch there. Um, and the last potential problem with these small galaxies, and in particular, the, the way that you see them around something like the Milky Way, is that they seem to be perhaps a little bit too organized, that they organize themselves into big planes of satellites that orbit around the Milky Way, rather than being scattered at, uh, more at random, which might be what you would expect based on just a sort of glance at this simulation that I've also put on the screen. So I'm going to say not a huge amount about this alignments issue. So I'll actually start with it because I don't have a, a huge amount to say about it. The, the claim is that if you go and map where the dwarf galaxies are around the Milky Way, as I say, they fall into some, some large planar structure, whereas in simulations using standard cosmology, uh, you would expect them to be slightly more randomly distributed. Now, it's not really clear just how significant that is. And there's quite a lot of uh, backwards and forwards in the literature about whether this is really a, a problem we should be too worried about. Um, but I think what, what's quite kind of interesting in this uh, is that it's not just the Milky Way. In fact, if you look at uh, Andromeda, there's a claim there as well that there's uh, planar structures of satellites around Andromeda. I think it's, if anything, it's less clear cut around Andromeda because the current claim is that you, you, you have sort of two intersecting planes of satellites around Andromeda. Um, and, uh, you know, you, when you start um, trying to work out the statistics of that and whether it's a likely thing or not a likely thing, you do run into uh, basic problems that it's actually quite hard to quantify exactly what we mean by these setups, exactly what counts as a plane of satellites and why we're allowing ourselves to just count one plane in the case of the Milky Way and then two planes in the case of Andromeda. It's, it's all quite confusing. And as I said a moment ago, I don't have a lot to add to this debate right now. I just wanted to include it in the list of things that I think are interesting and keeping an eye on because it may be some, something that's slightly in tension with what we would expect given our standard cosmological model. Something that I can say a little bit more about is the central densities. So just to remind you, this is about how much dark matter is there right at the centers of dwarf galaxies. And this is something that can be measured pretty well, especially if you go to dwarf galaxies that are re relatively far away from our Milky Way, so that they haven't had any uh, frustrating, annoying interactions with our Milky Way that can make things confusing. They're still holding on to some gas. So you can use the rotation of that gas to infer how much material is present. And what you're looking at here is um, a, a compilation from some of Kyle Oman's work, where he's showing a rotation curves, that is how fast things in, in the dwarf galaxy are rotating as a function of radius. And the points with error bars are um, observational results. They're actually measured for, for specific galaxies. And then the, the lines are what you would guess would be the rotation curve of this galaxy based on cosmological simulations. That is to say, 
based on assuming that dark matter behaves as it does in our standard cosmological paradigm. And what you can see is if you compare the points with error bars against the, the lines in these plots, there's actually quite large mismatches in some cases. And overall, on average, you, you, you typically find, oops, you typically find that you um, end up with uh, rotation curves that under, uh, that, that in, in the real universe, they're rotating less quickly at the center than you would expect. And that's corresponding to saying there's less dark matter present uh, at the center of these dwarf galaxies than our simulations or, or modeling uh, would lead you to expect. And the, the other thing that's quite surprising about this is there's quite a lot of scatter around that relation. So when you look at other galaxies, you actually find that the rotation curves are somewhat higher than you would expect. So it would seem that there's too much dark matter at the center of these galaxies. So that's the, uh, the problem with central densities. Now, I think we have a leading contender to explain this. I mean, one possibility, of course, is that we've got something wrong about the way we're, the assumptions we're making about dark matter, that it actually behaves in a different way. But I think that uh, there's a sort of Occam's razor that you can apply here and say, well, uh, since the assumptions we're making about dark matter are kind of maximally simple, cold dark matter is the simplest possible idea you can have of dark matter. Uh, it uh, doesn't really uh, bounce off anything. Uh, it, it barely moves except when gravity starts uh, pulling it around. So it's a really kind of simple, natural model of dark matter. So if you apply Occam's razor, you'd say, uh, let's look for other possible explanations that don't require us to have dark matter doing exotic things. And in fact, there's a very natural explanation for that. If you go and look at real dwarf galaxies in, in the universe, and this is just one randomly chosen example, DDO 75, here I'm showing you a composite image. The, the red here is actually radio data showing you where the neutral hydrogen is in this galaxy. Um, and, the, and, and the blue is uh, UV uh, imaging, which is showing you uh, where young stars are. And what you should notice from this is that there are lots of young stars at the center of this dwarf galaxy, and they're kind of surrounded by a shell of neutral hydrogen. Now, the, the, the interpretation of that is that you had quite a lot of cool gas in this galaxy relatively recently. Some of it formed into stars. And then once you've formed a bunch of stars at the center of this galaxy, they'll start going supernovae. So you inject lots of energy into the remaining gas, and that kind of sweeps it back out of the system. This isn't about the dark matter directly. It, this, this only, you know, the, the, the shock wave from a supernova only directly affects the gas. But um, some of the first work I, I did on this was, was thinking about the effect of those shock waves and their gravitational effect in particular on the dark matter. Now, if you imagine that you, you are clearing out gas from a galaxy rather slowly, then any dark matter that's orbiting around within that galaxy notices that the potential is getting shallower. And as a result, the dark matter orbit expands. But later, if the uh, gas comes back, which you would expect it to do, eventually it's gonna cool back down and the gas is gonna come back then uh, the potential well steepens back up again and the dark matter orbit actually contracts again. So it, it comes back to where it started. So if you imagine that dwarf galaxies have a gentle lifestyle that, yeah, sometimes they form some stars and then they gently get rid of some of their gas and it gently comes back in, then absolutely nothing would happen to the dark matter in response to that. But what's kind of interesting is that you can think of an alternative scenario where actually the, the, the supernova shockwave pushes material out really fast. And that means that the potential well flattens really quickly. And even if the gas then later comes back in so that the potential being generated by the gas returns to its original form, you find that on average, this actually imparts energy to uh, particles that are orbiting around within the dwarf galaxy potential well. So what that means in practice is that dark matter kind of gets chucked out. You can almost think of it as sort of gravitationally dragging some of the dark matter out of the center of these galaxies each time a clump of stars forms and explodes in supernovae. 
And you'd expect this to be particularly effective in dwarf galaxies because they're relatively small systems, the potential well is quite shallow, and so you know even just a single supernova going off can be enough to quite dramatically disrupt the gas in the centre of these galaxies. So it's quite a natural potential explanation. And since putting this forward, there's been a lot of interest in measuring uh, using sort of the, the, the uh, inferred star formation histories of observed dwarfs. Can you piece together, did their star formation proceed in little bursts? Because if it proceeded in little bursts, then you're in something like the bottom scenario. And that should quite naturally lead to, to dark matter being dragged out of the galaxy and perhaps would explain these, uh, these observations where the rotation curves weren't quite matching what we were initially expecting. And it could also explain the diversity, because when you see galaxies at a different stage of, of this life cycle, or if you just happen to see a galaxy that didn't go through too many of these bursts, then uh, you, would, you would find that the dark matter content would still be very concentrated. Whereas when you look at a dwarf galaxy which has had lots of these bursts, the dark matter content will be quite spread out. So as a potential explanation, I think it's a, a pretty good one. But uh, one of the real themes of the last few years has been to try and understand, can we really show that this is a play in the real universe? And I'm going to come back to that uh, towards the end with uh, uh, just an example that I think is particularly interesting, a kind of challenge to whether this scenario can really account for what we're seeing. But as I say, I'm going to come back to that uh, because first um, I'm going to move on to some of the other issues where dwarf galaxies come into contact with cosmology. So I'm going to say something about the missing satellites problem. This is, as I was saying a moment ago, the idea that when you uh, perform a computer simulation and you try to predict where the dark matter is around the Milky Way, it comes in lots of little clumps. And in, in principle, you could expect each of those each of those little clumps to be carrying with it some gas and stars and so to be one of these little dwarf galaxies. Um, but when you look in the real universe, you only really see a handful of satellites um, around the Milky Way. And so at face value, it's certainly in the 90s, it was felt there was a, a sort of a massive discrepancy between what appeared to be out there and uh, what seemed to be uh, expected from simulations. Now, those two pictures have kind of met in the middle uh, in the sense that in recent years we've discovered many many more satellites observationally and i'll be showing you some of that in just a moment so on the one hand observationally it's uh, been become possible to, to find many more satellites on the other hand theoretically it's become better and better understood that not all of these little chunks of dark matter will actually have um, a galaxy in them and so the, the number of uh, satellites expected theoretically has dropped, while the number of satellites known observationally has risen and they've kind of met in the middle. Um, and so, you know, the most recent work on this comes from deep surveys like DES uh, and, and PANSTARS. Here's a nice plot from uh, Ethan Nadler, who, who works in Risa Wexler's group. Um, and what you're seeing here is on, on the x-axis, it's uh, the magnitude, in other words, the, the brightness of uh, satellites. And on the y-axis, you're seeing a cumulative count of how many satellites there are that are um, uh, brighter than that particular limit. So the, the, the heavy black line shows you all the known satellites. You can see that there are uh, many dozens of these now, and, and some of them are very faint indeed. Um, and the, the grey line is... Um, what you would expect um, if you, it's uh, a way to put this, the, the, the gray line is, is what you would expect if you take into account the fact that you, you haven't been able to find satellites everywhere, all on, you know, all over the sky. So the fact that there's some incompleteness in our census of the satellites enters into this calculation. Um, and so as a result of that, you know, there's a correction uh, from what you actually know about to what you expect really to be out there. Once you make that correction, it's possible to actually match that up 
with sort of extrapolations from simulations, which is what you see as the band here. So it is at least possible to bring everything into nice agreement. However, this, this does require you to do a, a, a little bit of um, uh, fitting, in effect. It's, it's essentially saying we're going to assume that there's some relationship between the uh, overall mass of dark matter in a satellite and the actual brightness of that satellite on the sky. And so although it's possible to make that mapping in such a way that everything adds up, the attention now shifts to whether the, um, the particular mappings that we need between the dark matter, dark matter universe and the luminous universe actually make any sense. This is sometimes expressed uh, in, in the following way through what's sometimes called the, the halo mass stellar mass relation. So I'm going to show you this plot and talk about it a fair amount. Uh, on the x-axis, you have the dynamical mass, so that's the total mass of one of these little satellite systems that we believe to be orbiting around the Milky Way. And on the y-axis, you have the stellar mass. So that's the, the uh, thing that's actually determining how visible the, the satellite is in a telescope. Now, the red line that I've just drawn over the top there is what you would get if you assume a constant mass to light ratio. That is, you assume that every chunk of dark matter that comes in carries with it some complement of stars. Um, and you, you would expect then a particular one to one relationship between the dynamical mass and the stellar mass. And that gets you to the missing satellites problem, in fact, that if you assume that one to one relation, then you end up with far too many luminous objects um, compared to, to what's actually seen. So actually what people uh, are doing, like uh, uh, the Ethan Nadler work that I was showing you just a moment ago, they're, they're kind of exploring, well, how much do you have to reduce this? You know, at, given, given a, 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 a satellite with a particular dark matter mass, how much do you have to crank down its stellar mass in order to start hiding away enough of these satellites that they don't show up in our surveys. Um, and there the are perfectly reasonable uh, explanations for why stellar mass, as you go down to lower and lower dynamical masses, you end up with smaller and smaller stellar masses. That, that perfectly reasonable explanations for that. Um, they're based on the same ideas I was talking about a moment ago, that if you have, uh, if you form a bunch of stars in a small system, and you pump in lots of supernova energy, that will tend to just blow out the remaining gas from that system, making it much harder for it to form more stars. And so providing you this uh, reduction in the stellar mass at fixed uh, dark matter mass that, that, that you're looking for. And there are other effects as well, like the fact that the, the whole universe is awash with ultraviolet radiation, and that can heat up gas. And in particular, if you only have a shallow potential well, because you've got a small clump of dark matter, uh, that heating effect can pretty much just boil off the gas and the gas leaves the system and can't form more stars again. So it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But the question now becomes, can our simulations, can our standard picture of cosmology really account for the kind of reductions that we're claiming here are required? So. First of all, um, I want to just highlight that there's uh, observational evidence in this direction as well. So if you look at the, the, the blue lines on this plot, not the shaded region for a moment, but just the blue lines on this plot, I've overplotted some points with error bars here, which are a compilation from Justin Reed, where he's used um, the, uh, the, the, the rotation of dwarf irregular galaxies and the, the, um, the velocities within dwarf irregular galaxies to make an estimate of the uh, total dynamical masses of galaxies and also measured their stellar masses. So these are real objects in the real universe. And you can see for those that they lie more or less along these uh, blue lines that I've plotted on here. Um, but those are things that are out in the, uh, in the field, that is, they're out beyond the reaches of the Milky Way. The band that you see below that on this plot is the uh, relation, this so-called abundance matching relation from uh, Rita Wexler's group, which is showing you that 
around the Milky Way, if you want to account for the satellites around the Milky Way, you need even less stellar mass at fixed dynamical mass. Um, and that's, again, probably okay, because if you take a, a dwarf galaxy that's merrily forming stars and you drop it into something like the Milky Way, the tidal effects of the Milky Way and the, the stripping effect, the, the, the fact that there's a, a halo around the Milky Way which strips away gas from those dwarf galaxies, and again, further reduces the, the mass of stars that you would expect to see. So it's still kind of okay that the uh, observations of what's out there in the field are lying above what you need to explain the abundance of satellites around the Milky Way. That's still, I think, fine. Where the situation gets kind of confusing is when you also add in the results from simulations. So here I'm adding in results from a couple of simulations that, that are uh, widely uh, used in, in cosmology. These are the Nihau simulations and the fire simulations from two different simulation groups. Now, these dots are individual galaxies that they've simulated, um, but then they're, they're not supposed to be galaxies that are around a Milky Way. They're supposed to be galaxies out in the field. So they really ought to be agreeing with the purple dots and the, and the blue lines that I've drawn on this figure, but they're not. They're actually producing stellar masses that are too low. So the situation we've got to with current simulations is that the effect of supernova feedback and other forms of feedback on dwarf galaxies is seemingly over-suppressing. It's forming too few stars now, given a particular dark matter mass, it's almost like we've gone to, you know, the, the original simulations were forming too many stars um, and we've gone too far in correcting that in some sense. And an, an, another way of seeing this problem, perhaps a sort of slightly more direct way of seeing this problem uh, is uh, in a paper that uh, we wrote a couple of years ago, looking at the metallicities of dwarf galaxies, where actually you find that observationally, even very, very faint dwarf galaxies, so that's the ones on the left of this plot, are still enriched by, you know, at, at least uh, they, they get enriched to about a thousandth of solar metallicity. Um, and the fact that that happens is essentially telling you that you can't just have formed one little clump of stars and had it blow out all the gas in the galaxy, and just had one generation of stars and blown out everything and never formed any more stars ever again. So when you see these faint dots in the background, those are the observational data points. So those faint dots are telling you that observationally, uh, the dwarf galaxies we actually see have, um, although they're very low metallicities, they're not going uh, below about a, a thousandth of solar. Whereas when you run simulations that have this kind of dramatic feedback in them, that's really pushing stuff out of dwarf galaxies, then you actually end up with metallicities that are too low because it's just far too dramatic. So there's definitely something still to be understood there um, about what's going on. One possibility is that the feedback is actually uh, slightly more gentle than some of the uh, recipes that we've uh, come up with um, in, in recent years. And in fact, some of the most recent simulations, which I'm just adding to the plot here now, do go in that direction. So it's kind of uh, having, having overcompensated in the simulation world, we're now kind of coming back towards having uh, slightly more moderate stellar masses, uh, slightly more moderate suppressions of the stellar masses for these smallest objects. And at this point, it starts to feel all um, a, a little bit frustrating because we seem to be going all over the place. And uh, we're also still ending up, if you look at this, with um, stellar masses that our, are, are still seemingly rather too low when you go out and compare them to what we actually see out there um, beyond, beyond the Milky Way's reaches. So the black dots that I was just showing you actually come from a simulation, set of simulations that uh, I've been running along with uh, colleagues at, in, at Surrey University, mainly led by Justin Reed there and uh, Lund University with uh, Oscar Agertz. Um, and what we're trying to understand in, in that 
project is both um, to get to better grips with all of these feedback processes and whether we're really modeling them in the correct way, but also to understand the role that different formation histories might have had on those galaxies that we've simulated. There's a bit of a question about whether we're really comparing apples to apples, which I'm going to explain in just a moment. But this, like, this nice summary plot shows you what we've done. We've taken a little uh, chunk of the universe and in particular looked into a void where there are no big galaxies at all. And inside that void, we've re-simulated uh, the individual galaxies at very high resolution to try and understand uh, what's really going on inside those simulations. There's a little bit more to it. There's a little more to it that I'll tell you in just a second. But I want to uh, connect this to a, a very exciting development in observations. So I'm going to show you a plot that, that Martin Ray, who was a student at UCL, made for his thesis, which is showing you uh, is a slightly different view of dwarf galaxies that are known dwarf galaxies, showing not just how bright they are, but also what their half light radius is. That is how diffuse they are, whether they're very concentrated uh, or whether they're very spread out. And if you take a look at this as a function of time, you find that two things have happened over time. First of all, over time, we've been certainly going to, to fainter objects. Uh, so, you know, you fill in the bottom half of this when as you go forwards in time. But the other observational development uh, that becomes obvious when you stare at this is we've also, at, at a given brightness, been going to more diffuse objects. So you, if you look at a fixed magnitude, then uh, over time, there's a tendency to, to be finding things which are larger and larger. And these things are hard to find, of course, because even though their total brightness is, is perhaps not that low, they are, um, they're very diffuse. And so a couple of recent discoveries that you can add to this plot are uh, one, with, one with Gaia data and one with hypersupreme cam data, which is kind of, think of it almost like a forerunner to LSST, which is coming very soon. And will will take really deep imaging and allow you to find things uh, easily at 31 magnitude per square arc second. Um, so the, the fact that the precursors to these kind of experiments are starting to find more dwarf galaxies down there might be telling us we don't actually have yet a complete census mm -hmm of what galaxies have what stellar masses. Because you know, if you look at fixed stellar mass, which is fixed V-band magnitude in this, in this plot, then uh, you, you could still be finding more and more things at fainter and fainter surface brightnesses. We don't really know what there is down there to be found. So as I say, with, this, uh, with these edge simulations, we were particularly interested in understanding the diversity, how, how different might one dwarf galaxy be to another? And we do this by running cosmological simulations. I'm showing you an example here where you're seeing the gas density over time. And uh, you, you can see at early times, there's lots and lots of gas blobs that, have, that are within those, they're actually forming stars. So each blob is uh, a, a separate little proto galaxy. But when you get to about redshift six, which is where I've paused the movie here, those gas blobs start to disappear. That's the effect of something called reionization, that all the gas in the universe is being heated up. And so very quickly, all of those structures stop being able to form stars. They can only form stars while the gas is cool enough. And then reionization comes along, heats up all the gas, and they stop forming any more stars. This is an effect that, that has been known about for a long time and is a large part of the resolution of the missing satellite problem. But what we were kind of interested in is the way that you can have variations in that process. So the early universe, uh, as probed by something like the Planck satellite and the cosmic microwave background that I was showing you earlier, earlier on, um, consists of something called a Gaussian random field. And so it's got random fluctuations in it. And those random fluctuations in the early universe map into the particular history of a dwarf galaxy in the later universe. So, for example, how much gas it had 
as a function of time. When did it build up its mass? When did it merge with other systems? All these things are determined ultimately by these random fluctuations in the early universe. And I don't have time today to go into any technical details, but we have an approach uh, that we call genetic modification to, uh, to, to, to get slightly different versions of this early universe. So you make very, very tiny changes to the random outcomes in the early universe, just to explore what would happen if the early universe had turned out in a slightly different way. And uh, you can then, run a second version of your simulation. So if I run these side by side, then you can see that they basically, it's the same galaxy. It forms out of the same kind of set of gas structures, but the, the particular mergers happen at slightly different times. The particular masses of galaxies at any one moment is slightly different. And this allows you to um, explore in a very um, uh, robust way, in a very careful way, how these potential slight differences in the history of any given galaxy would affect how it turns out. So this is a, a, a plot that, that, that Martin made showing you that it, he's introduced some particular changes to a galaxy which just change as a function of time its mass. So that by redshift zero, that is the present day universe, which you see at the right here, they all have the same mass. So in our accounting for all these satellite galaxies, they, um, they, would, all, uh, they would all turn up at the same place in terms of their dynamical mass. But they built up that mass at different rates uh, from the early universe. And although these galaxies end up having the same mass of dark matter, if you then take a look at what, ma what stellar mass they end up with, it's, it's radically, radically different. And that's because this process of reionization interacts very differently with uh, the way that the galaxy evolved. If you form very late, then you have almost no time at all to build up your stars compared to if you formed very early. And um, so if I, go, if I go all the way back to this uh, plot of the observational points, what's kind of interesting about this is that you can take this system which has precisely the same uh, dynamical mass and change its stellar mass and the, the, these points connected by the line are that simulated system that all have different stellar masses but they also end up with uh, different sizes essentially because the way you actually build the galaxy ends up affecting how diffuse it is. So uh, what this work is all about is really kind of quantifying how is it that very extended galaxies, very extended dwarf galaxies, which are therefore very hard to find, but should turn up with things like LSST, uh, could have been formed? So I'm aware I'm very nearly out of time. I'm going to mention one more thing, which I think is really uh, capturing our interest at the moment. And that's whether we can try and infer how much dark matter is right at the centers of the very faintest dwarf galaxies. So earlier on, I was telling you that the, the central dark matter densities of dwarf galaxies potentially can be solved, that that mismatch between theory and uh, observation potentially can be solved if you have processes where you form some stars and it chucks out gas repeatedly in a kind of quite a violent way. But when you go to really faint objects, they simply haven't formed enough stars for that process to be um, particularly efficient. Um, and so it's, it's, it's of particular interest to go to really faint systems. I'm showing you Eridanus II here, which is an uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxy. You can barely see it here. In fact, you know, all the stuff you can see on this uh, Hubble ACS image is, is actually mainly background stuff. If you look closely, all the little dots are the foreground galaxy that's extremely uh, diffuse and dim. Um, can we measure uh, what the dark matter is doing in systems like that. And there's tentatively uh, a positive answer to that. It turns out that the, uh, uh, for reasons that I'm not going to go into because it's too technical, but when you see off star clusters, so it, within this dwarf galaxy, there's actually a star cluster, which is the thing that's highlighted at the center. The very existence of that star cluster suggests there can't be too much dark matter right at the center of this very tiny galaxy. 
Um, and that in turn could be problematic. Um, so it, it's very hard to understand. We're not really sure that we can justify that you can pull out enough dark matter from very tiny systems like this uh, to explain the existence of these star clusters. In any case, I wanted to just finish by going back to where I started. There are a whole range of issues with dwarf galaxies in cosmology. I don't think any of these constitute a crisis. Um, I do think that they're of a, a lot of interest that uh, we should continue to, to, to try and understand these things because they may be telling us that actually something about what we're assuming in, in cosmology is, is not quite right. And of course, you have to add to that also topics that I haven't had time to talk to talk, talk, talk about today, things like the apparent discrepancies in how fast the universe is actually expanding, the Hubble tension, um, and also uh, the, the, the fact that there seems to be something slightly strange about what's going on with the structure around us locally. All of these things have to be somehow taken together and I think this is why there is a sense in the community that maybe there is some kind of crisis. On the other hand, since I've been given a free hand to finish with some philosophy, um, I thought I would uh, quote some Kuhn at you. Uh, Thomas Kuhn was a, a philosopher of science who I think really captured how science actually works, unlike so many philosophers of science who have some other idea that, of how science should work. I think Thomas Kuhn really captures how science really does work. And uh, he points out that, you know, once you have something like Lambda CDM that has the status of a paradigm, you, you're not going to just throw it away because of some anomalies. All you can do is keep working with it uh, and keep working and thinking creatively about alternatives to it uh, until an alternative candidate turns up to take its place. And there certainly isn't an alternative candidate uh, for uh, cosmology for, for Lambda CDM cosmology right now. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll put this conclusion slide and I'll stop. That's wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Interesting, um, interesting thoughts to finish on there. Um, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fantastic lecture, um, extremely clear um, and engaging. I've enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Thank you. I can see there are some questions coming through. So I'm going to hand over to Louise, who's going to help facilitate uh, the Q&A. Thanks, Louise. Well, thanks very much, Andrew. That was a, a really great talk. Uh, we've got some questions coming in now. So the first one is from Tamer Saifalahi. Uh, what are the consequences of supernova feedback and the following changes in the galaxy's properties due to the feedback, such as the dark matter profile, on the radial distribution of the globular clusters around galaxies. Okay, yeah, so, so certainly these, these kind of fluctuations in the gravitational potential can, uh, uh, can affect stars and can affect uh, clusters as well. So there's a, there's a couple of things to, to think about here, I think. What, the first is that those potential fluctuations that can chuck out dark matter, can sort of pull out dark matter, they can uh, also pull out stars in just the same way. In fact, stars behave almost just like dark matter because they're like, to, 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 uh, to simulators, they're like collisionless particles. So uh, they can be pulled out and it can, it can actually increase the overall half-light uh, radius. And I think the question is specifically about clusters of stars. And so that can happen to the clusters of stars as well. But I think there's perhaps an even more interesting thing, which was the uh, Eridanus II example that I was just uh, quoting to you, where uh, if you have a, 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 something like a globular cluster of stars, you would typically expect it in a dwarf galaxy to sink quite quickly through dynamical friction. It's like a, a massive thing which focuses orbits of dark matter around it and that causes a dynamical friction effect that causes it to sink to the center. And when it sinks to the center, the tidal forces there will rip it apart quite easily. Whereas if you have a dark matter core, it turns out that dynamical friction becomes very ineffective. And so globular clusters or other types of star clusters can can uh, they, they don't sink to the center so easily and they can survive for much longer. 
So the overall effect then to kind of summarize is that you can chuck things out and also you also stop them falling in so easily as well. Uh, and so you generally expect there to be more uh, star clusters in, in galaxies when you have uh, these dark matter redistribution effects. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we've got uh, another question from Simon Josie, who said, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, you showed four dwarf galaxy rotation curves early on in your talk. Three had central densities that were too low, and you suggested this was due to dark matter redistribution by supernova-driven outflows. However, the fourth rotation curve had a central density that was too high. Uh, what's the explanation in, in this case? Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. And I think the particular paper I was showing those from uh, is Kyle Oman's work. And his, his entire point was there's a great diversity in, in these things. It's not uh, as totally straightforward case of they're always too low. Um, there are, I think, honestly, I think it, it's not entirely clear. I don't think there's a single agreed upon answer about why this diversity is there. But there are a few possible reasons. One is that it's actually very... Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that you can go straight from a rotation curve to inferring the mass in the galaxy uh, is, is a slight oversimplification that I committed there. But actually, you have to take into account the fact that it's not like there's gas there just going on perfectly circular orbits. Um, in, in reality, you don't have a perfectly uh, flat, thin disk. Uh, so there's a lot of extra effects to take into account. So one possible explanation you can give is that in some cases, just because of some peculiarity about the galaxy, maybe there's some shock wave going through the gas or so on, you might misinfer, you know, you might, you might be um, over-interpreting the, the, the rotation curve. But actually, um, it, it's not really giving you an accurate indication of what mass is in there. Um, people try to be very careful about this, and I think overall um, that's not as much of a concern as it used to be. Um, the, the, the other explanation is more of a physical one, that you have a, a galaxy where you just had lots of, so, so, so maybe it hasn't had these very uh, uh, these, these sort of bursts of star formation that would chuck the dark matter out, and if you've just uh, had lots more gas cool down into the center of that galaxy, that can temporarily drag dark matter with it actually through something called adiabatic contraction. So it's possible that physically you are actually looking at a galaxy with a sort of excess of dark matter because it's being gravitationally pulled in. Or the third thing is maybe it's some effect that we don't yet understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve Miller is asking, since you have invoked Kuhn, Kuhn points out that scientists add auxiliary hypotheses on and on until the main paradigm can no longer support their weight. Uh, then you get a paradigm shift. So how close do you think you are to needing a paradigm shift? I, I think, uh, so, so I'm a huge fan of Kuhn and I think um, that he's absolutely right. Um, but I think it's it, it's only really possible to identify it in retrospect that actually when, when you're doing normal science in, in, in his terms, it's not really possible to to be sure whether you're just uh, you, whether you're building up towards a paradigm shift like that or, or whether you are actually just discovering additional effects that always should have been taken into account. And, you know, the universe is just a complicated place. So I, I, I slightly dodging the question. But um, I, I honestly think that that will only become clear in retrospect. OK, I'm going to one final question because we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Uh, this is from Hiranya Piris. Fabulous talk. Do you think that tuning feedback contributions to get better matches to data impacts the predictivity of ga galaxy evolution models? and hence impacts their ability to distinguish between cosmological models. Is there any prospect for improving feedback models without tuning by comparison to data? Well, thanks very much. Well, I should say Hiranya is one of the key collaborators in this. So hello, Hiranya. <laughs> thanks for the question. I, I think um, the, the, the short answer is yes, that if you're 
and, and, and this, of course, is, is actually a very prevalent approach in the field is to tune all of these difficult bits of physics that we don't really understand, tune the unknown parameters to, um, uh, to, to, to match what we already know about the universe. I think it's a, it's a hugely dangerous thing to do. Sometimes it's necessary. But when you do that, you have to be very aware about what what it's doing, it sort of collapsing down your um, ability to actually distinguish uh, the cosmological questions that you, you were originally going after. There are ways around that, you know, you can you can try and find observational signals that are are very, very sort of orthogonal, if you like, to the things that you've actually constrained on. So for example, you could constrain on stellar masses, but then go and test what's happening in the gas. I think that gives you some kind of predictivity uh, that you, you can use if you're careful enough. But more generally, I think it would be very nice to imagine that one day we understand astrophysics well enough that we don't really need these parameters, or at least not quite as many of them. And that's actually what the EDGE uh, collaboration is sort of trying to do, that we, we are trying to put in as, as little as possible in the way of tunable knobs and rather write down what we believe to be true about the astrophysics. Um, so I, I think in the long term, it would be very nice if everything goes in that direction, but it's a huge ask because astrophysics is just such, such a complicated thing. Thank you, thank you very much, Andrew. I am sorry that we're out of time. I'm going to hand back to Emma now. Thank you very much, Louise. And, and thanks again to Professor Andrew Ponson for such a fantastic Gerald Whitrow lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, thanks to everybody for coming to the meeting this afternoon. It's, it's great to have you all here. Um, so all that remains for today is just in uh, closing remarks to give notice that the next monthly ANG meeting of the Society will be on Friday the 9th of April and we look forward to seeing all of you then. Thanks a lot everybody and good afternoon. <laughs>